So it's my great pleasure now to invite Dr. Meryl Turpin to the stage. So Meryl is a senior lecturer, lecturer in occupational therapy in my school at the University of Queensland. And a central element of the research that Meryl does is to try and draw together theory and practice. One area of research that she does relates to clinical reasoning in healthcare professionals. So exploring different types of knowledge and how they use that knowledge to engage in reasoning and decision making. And the other element of what she does is what she's going to talk about today, and that is the experiences of people with disability and chronic health conditions and using that in the context of daily life. So today, Meryl's going to discuss the delivery of care and support based on understanding people's experiences. So thank you, Meryl. Today, I'm going to talk to you about listening to people's experiences. So it's quite different from um, what Professor Dollar talked about. So in 1973, Susan Sontag famously wrote, illness is the night side of life, a more onerous citizenship. Everyone who is born holds dual citizenship. In the kingdom of the well and in the kingdom of the sick. Although we all prefer to use the good passport, sooner or later each of us is obliged, at least for a spell, to identify ourselves as citizens of this other place. I speak to you today as a verified dual passport holder, a citizen of both, both kingdoms. As a citizen of the kingdom of the, head of the well, I've been a qualitative researcher for three decades. As a citizen of the kingdom of the sick, I've had a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis or MS for 13 years and symptoms for more than a decade before that. Living with this dual perspective has, um, has depth to my perception of life. I can see things from both vantage points. As an academic at the University of Queensland, I experienced the status of it being a well uh, sorry, I experienced the status of being a well known researcher in my field, hailing from an internationally renowned and research intensive um, university. As a disabled person, I know about the difficulty of finding and accessing services that I need um, and the unre unreliability of paid help. I can also tell you about the generosity of people to help when I'm a bit stuck. Sorry, I just need to... On, yes. Today, I'm going to talk to you about my experiences as a qualitative researcher, my experiences as a disabled person and service user, and the power of listening to people's experiences. I will end by reflecting on how the stories of people's experiences can be used to promote change. So let's start. I'm, I'm a qualitative researcher. So qualitative research differs from quantitative research in that we are not trying to establish facts by comparing outcomes in terms of statistically significant differences. Instead, we are trying to gain a greater understanding of a phenomenon, just like depth perception. Investigating a phenomenon from different vantage points 
provides a rich three-dimensional understanding of it. When I'm talking with research participants during interviews or ethnographic observations, I try to see things from their perspective, suspending my own. I was particularly aware of this need to do this when I was conducting interviews with people who experienced MS fatigue. It was around the time that I was being investigated for MS. The great irony is that I was an MS, fatigue, uh, MS researcher long before I was diagnosed with MS. In, when talking to participants, I had to be 100% with them. The interview had to be about them. I had to enter their narrated world completely to explore their experiences deeply. And then it was only later when the interview was over that I can indulge in self-reflection and wonder what it all meant for me. I'm also a disabled person and um, service user. About 10 years ago, I became a wheelchair user. In many ways, it was a relief to have an external indicator that I was a disabled person. My disability was no longer invisible and I didn't have to either expend enormous amounts of energy hiding my disability or declaring my disability not being believed because I looked normal. More recently, I became an NDIS participant. Well, now, after three years, I'm a seasoned um, service user. But when it first started, I was a complete novice. Even though I was a very experienced occupational therapist and understood how health and disability services worked, I floundered as a service user. What I particularly found overwhelming was the amount of time it took to establish services and attend them. I already had a demanding full-time job and it was like having an extra part-time job on top of that. Also, I had to make up for lost time, a uh, lost work time on the weekends because allied health services were only offered Monday to Friday nine to five. Luckily, as a university academic, I could do that, but not everyone can. I recently um, travelled to Chile to give presentations at a number of universities there. And while I won't burden you with the myriad difficulties of travelling with a power wheelchair and almost missing flights because of poor processes at airports, particularly in Australia. I will share one amusing anecdote. When we arrived back um, in Australia, the wheelchair that they provided for me at the airplane door had foot plates that kept dropping to the ground with the weight of my legs. How did we solve this? We'll picture this. My husband held up my outstretched um, feet, legs, um, and ran backwards up the aero bridge while the assistant pushed the wheelchair. So after telling you something of my experiences, I now have to step back and consider some of the issues that make listening to people's experiences valuable. First, they can expose us to different perspectives. I hope that telling you about my dual passport has added to your perception. 
listening to the experience of others prompts reactions in us. We might agree, disagree, be concerned for them, uh, be offended, or we might think their ideas are good or not. Regardless of the nature of our reaction, we are engaged with their experiences. Being able to imaginatively shift and expand our perspectives is valuable clinically and in research terms can help us to gain new theoretical understandings. Second, they make us curious and want to ask questions. For example, when listening to someone's experiences, you might ask, how similar or different are they from those of the people? What themes are evident in the person's experiences? And clinically, how can, how can I use this knowledge to improve outcomes when working with them? And what variations in um, people's experiences does this make me wonder about? Thirdly, they highlight context and demonstrate that experience is situated in specific times and places. The life course perspective emphasizes that people live in specific times and historical times and places, and that their lives are closely linked to those of others. We need to listen carefully to people's situations as they will have a major impact on the outcomes for them. And then finally, being listened to is empowering. Taking the time to listen conveys hope and value to people. So let's now reflect on using stories of people's experiences to promote change. The power to affect change has long been recognised. National inquiries always elicit broad, a broad range of experiences in order to understand the breadth and depth of an issue. Um, if, we can see, if we consider the recent Royal Commission into violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability. We see that the Commission heard from 837 people in public hearings, 1,785 people in private hearings and received 7,944 submissions. In the final report, Volume 1 is entitled Voices of People with Disability. And it comprises story after story of people's experiences. The importance of experience is emphasised in their executive summary. It states, the voices and experiences of people with disability have guided our approach to the policy question influenced the subject matter of hearings and informed the conclusions and recommendations of our final report. When thinking about why stories of people's experiences can be so powerful, three things come to mind. First, they can raise awareness of issues and provide evidence um, that those issues exist. Second, they can be used to develop a nuanced understanding of circumstances affecting health and service use. Because they are situated in specific times and places, stories can reveal details and subtleties that cannot be conveyed by generalised principles. And finally, we all learn through stories in our everyday lives. Therefore, we're attuned to them and they carry weight. Because of this, 
they can be used to change community attitudes. In closing, listening to people's experiences can powerfully inform healthcare. It can help health professionals as individuals and groups become more aware of the issues that affect people's outcomes and their abilities to follow recommendations. It can inform policy development and qualitative research methods that elicit experiences can be useful in the development of outcome measures. People's experiences can inform decisions about what to measure by identifying the factors that are meaningful to people in their lives. I hope that I've convinced you that listening to people's experiences can powerfully affect outcomes. We do have time for a couple of questions. Um, and I have, I have one quick one to get us started. And okay. you purposefully use the term disabled person rather than person with disability. Yes. And I'd like to hear you talk about why. Oh, okay. Um, so I it's it's um uh, based on the social model of disability. So um I, which emphasizes that people are not disabled by their you know, their lack of abilities, but are disabled by society. And and we're certainly so the the social model of disability really came about, it was particularly strong in the 1990s. Um, and what's interesting is that since then, a lot of the things that they were really advocating for um, have, have come about. So if you, if you look around Brisbane, for example, it's much more accessible Things are designed well. You can get around. I can catch a bus here. You know, there's curb cutouts where you need them, that kind of thing, um, in a way that that wouldn't have happened 30 years ago. Brilliant. Hmm. There's a question here. Uh, hello, Louise Bauer from the University of Sydney. Thank you so much, Meryl. Um, Meryl, you highlight the importance of listening to the stories of people with a disability or disabled people. I was wondering if you could talk about <clears throat> strategies for those of us who are clinicians, those of us involved in health services or whatever, the best, what do you think some of the best strategies for doing that? Um, because I think it can, my observation as I'm working in my areas is that sometimes we can almost overuse some individuals who are particularly articulate and I wonder about whether we're, um, putting too much, you know, we're overwhelming them. Um, yes. But how, how can we best be able to listen well? And are there examples of um, strategies that, that help people without overwhelming um, people with disabilities so that they're exhausted by yes. us? Yeah, I think um, Indigenous people would agree that it's not the role of disabled people to you know, um, educate us about what things are like for, for them. We need to find out ourselves, so we need to take responsibility for that. Um, the idea of, like, you know, um, relying on people too much is very much a kind of something that um, features in qualitative research so much because... There's always those quotes from people who just tell you so much and you just want to quote them all the time. But when you're writing, when you're analysing research and stuff, you really have to make sure that you're hearing from everyone. So I think um, before the professor was talking about bias and I think that we all, you know, can can lean towards the stories that are really powerful for us or the more articulate people. Um, but I was thinking as you were asking that, that there's probably two things. And one is that like on that broader scale, you know, if you're having disability reference groups or people, you know, who will um, tell you, inform you, 
then you probably are relying on those people a lot more. But if you're just working cl clinically, then you know you can you can listen to people and really understand their life circumstances. So you're not overly relying on anyone else except just them, and you do your goal is to understand them and understand what life is really like so that you can then make decisions about what's really probably going to be most useful for them, what's going to work in their life, that kind of thing. So I think there's those two elements. Brilliant. So we've come to the end of our time, and I really would like to thank you, Marilyn. So please join me. Thank you.